one of the many useful features of Nginx is rate limiting. In this tutorial, we'll go through the basics of configuring Nginx to limit the amount of HTTP requests a user can make in a given period of time. Now I say users, but the reality is that essentially most users won't ever need to be rate limited because most users uh, are human and they're going to be coming to your web page or accessing your data in a very simplistic and consistent way. Rate limiting can be utilized for security purposes. The idea is to slow down brute force, password guessing, and potentially DDoS attacks. And we do that by limiting the amount of incoming HTTP requests. A typical user may go to your web page and click on a link. They read or digest the data, and then they go to another page. So every maybe couple of seconds, depending if they're looking for something or whether they're reading, a user on your website might click a few times in the session that they are on your website. Now, of course, that's all good and well. But if, for example, someone was trying to maliciously attack your website, um, potentially, they were going to try to send multiple requests per second to perform that particular attack on your website. For those who need it, just very quickly, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the type of bot attacks that can be stopped by rate limiting. So I've mentioned brute force attacks. So please stop and go ahead and have a little read if you're not familiar with this. But the general idea is that a bot, a computer program, is designed to send data across to your server. Now, obviously, a user can click on a button quite quickly, but we could design an application to send multiple requests per second. A bad example of a brute force attack, maybe we have a login page. And the idea is that the bot here is going to go to your login page automatically or programmatically, and then it's going to try and inject a username and password multiple times per second. And it's going to potentially go through a, a library of username and passwords until eventually it gets a positive result and tries to log into your application. Now, Obviously, a normal, typical user experience, they may go to your login page and they may just uh, type in the username and password maybe two or three times. You may have some sort of system whereby you capture the user has tried to type in multiple times and you ask them to reset their password. Of course, a bot here in this case, in a brute force attack, for example, would potentially try and send multiple username and passwords per second until it gets a match. Now, what we want to try and do here with rate limiting is we want to limit the amount of times this bot can send us information to slow down the possibility of it trying to um, attack us in this manner. So the second type of an attack, a DDoS or DOS attack, is when a bot or multiple bots would send multiple requests to your server to try and overload it potentially with data to slow down the service. So again, the principles are the same here, although this isn't necessarily going to protect you against this in this case um, by just setting up rate limiting. It does potentially try to filter the amount of requests that are being sent over to our server here by restricting the amount of times a single bot can send data per second. And thirdly, I mentioned web scraping. So let's think of this as an API setup. Here we have an API setup um, whereby maybe we have a web server. Um, sorry, we have an API setup whereby the user um, receives a React front end and then sends API requests back to our server to retrieve the data. Now, an API can be fairly open, which means that anyone can access that endpoint potentially, um, depending on how it's set up. So we only want to the user to be able to access a certain amount of data um, per second um, in a natural way. Now, potentially web scraping is a general idea of setting up a program which will be able to go to your API or your uh, potentially your website, have a look at the data, scrape the data, collect that data and utilize it for some other means. Now, when it does that, potentially that bot we want to scrape data from every single web page. You might have thousands. And obviously, it's programmatically designed to do that. So therefore, it can do that in a number of seconds by sending multiple requests. Now, that might not be a desirable type of activity that you want to be performed 
on your infrastructure. So again, rate limiting can limit the amount of API requests a bot or a user can send to your server. Hopefully that's given you a better overview as to why rate limiting can be very important to protect your infrastructure. Now remember that security here is done in layers. So of course, this is just one layer of uh, many layers potentially that we would want to apply security. Now, it isn't always the case. Um, I'm not saying that Nginx has to be utilized uh, for rate limiting. There potentially are other areas uh, where this can be performed, of course. We're simply just showcasing in this tutorial that Nginx provides this type of service and how to configure that. So it would be useful for you to have seen the previous tutorials. We are going to work from a baseline code here. So previous code that we previously developed and explained. So by all means, go back and have a look at some of the previous tutorials. If you are looking for them, just head over to the head over to the channel um, where, wherever we are. And then you're going to find the playlist and then you'll find the Nginx Mastery series. And that's where you'll find all the previous tutorials. If you want to follow along step by step, there is a code or link, sorry, to the code in the video description. That would take you to the code. I'll explain that in a second. But in addition to that, we are going to be utilizing Docker here. So you're going to need to install Docker Desktop. It's available on Mac, Windows, Linux. And then in addition to that, I'm using Visual Studio Code. If you want to follow along, I'm using these following extensions. Nothing major here in terms of the plan of this tutorial. We'll start by running through a simple setup, downloading the code, getting it started, and then we'll go through some of the different configurations. Just before we start, a big thank you, as always, to our channel members, our Patreon members, and our channel subscribers. Thank you very much. If you are thinking about supporting us or supporting us further, please consider joining the channel or joining us on Patreon. If you are interested in following us on any of these socials, go to the About, and then you'll find links in there. So first up then, let's just go through the setup. Now you will find a link in the video description, which will take you to the repository for this series. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to be utilizing part four, reverse proxy uh, Django deploy. Uh, yeah, we're going to be utilizing that. So let's just go ahead, go ahead and download that however you want to download that. And then just open up this folder or create a new folder, put all the files into it, open that up in Visual Studio Code, and I'll meet you right there. So once you've downloaded part four, opened it up in Visual Studio Code, it's going to look a little bit like this. If you're not familiar with Docker Compose and Docker, etc., then it may, may be worth going back to some of the previous tutorials. So this is part four. This is where we ended up in part four. It's a simple setup where we created a configuration for a reverse proxy setup with Django. Now, it is irrelevant. You don't need to know Django or anything like that. We're just utilizing that as a way of showcasing some of the different directives and code that we can develop. A quick look at our configuration here. So this is it really. We have a browser uh, which can obviously connect via IP address to our Nginx server or send a request, sorry. I don't know why I said that. Um, we do have a DNS server. You can ignore that in this tutorial. So we have an Nginx container which then passes messages over to our backend container here, which is running G Unicorn and a Django instance. Essentially, that's what we're doing here. We don't have uh, cache setup in this tutorial at all, so you can ignore that. But we just have a simple setup with Nginx in a container and then GUnicorn and Django in a separate container. So what's happening here, here is Nginx is passing over um, data uh, over to our Django server and we're sending the data back. And then that's being then all served by Nginx back over to the browser. So you can see from our Docker Compose file, we have a container for Django here and also GUnicorn is set up there and it's binded uh, to port binded. It's bound to port 8000. Uh, so we expose 8000 here and we do have a environment ver variable file we need to set up. So let's just go ahead and quickly do that. So we need a folder called .env. So these are just some environment variables for security security reasons, um, you would want to probably set this up. Um, not necessarily in this way, um, but dev.env. Uh, this just makes sure that Django works correctly. So this is what's in our file. Uh, so you can just copy this. You can just copy and paste this. Obviously, there is a the code, the final code of this tutorial in the code 
um, that you found earlier in the GitHub repository. That's better in the GitHub repository that you found earlier. So you can just copy that out. But that's what we need there to get that working. Um, nothing else really much else to say. Um, if it still is a little bit confusing to you, then go back in the previous tutorial and have a look and I'll go through it step by step. Right. So with this setup, we're going to be working from this de default config. So we can get rid of that. Uh, so we're going to work from this default config. We're going to apply some rate limiting to this instance, to this example. So first of all, we're going to get this working. So I do have Docker installed. Uh, that was one of the requirements of this tutorial. And you can see that I removed all the containers and images. There's nothing left. Uh, so we can just go ahead now and run our Docker Compose. So Docker Compose and then just up a do. And that's going to build the images and containers if you're new to docker i do have a docker extension here for visual studio code and just makes it easy for you to see the containers and navigate the containers um, if you haven't started utilizing that so all the containers are up and running so it should be working okay let's just pass that into the browser so we should just be using 12700 on the loopback address and there we go so we can now access our web server through nginx so I do like how Nginx describe rate limiting. Uh, they describe it uh, like a leaky bucket algorithm. So if you imagine you had a bucket with lots of holes in it, the idea is, is that you put loads of water in the bucket and then it leaks out slowly throughout the holes. And that really kind of sums up uh, the idea of utilizing rate limiting. So in this analogy, of course, the water represents the user's request. Now, the idea here is obviously we may have lots of user requests at once. So that kind of fills the bucket up really quickly. And then because we've applied rate limiting, the small holes will leak out the water very slowly. So behind the scenes here, like we saw in the previous tutorial where we were discussing uh, A-B or split testing, everything here is working uh, with algorithms so um, it's just data essentially at the end of the day and that data is being managed by algorithms and here we're using a first in first out scheduling algorithm to determine what should be processed uh, first so essentially here we are going to be having some sort of queue system data comes in forms in a queue and then that would get processed first in first out using a, a fee FIFO scheduling algorithm, first in, first out. I'm not too sure why I said FIFO, <laughs> FIFO or FIFO, however you describe it. Now, this is incredibly easy to set up. Now, I say that because I know how to set up, but I think it is fairly simple to set up and they're at least a basic setup, right? So here we have essentially two uh, directives or two main directives for configuring rate limiting, and that's going to be the limit request zone and the limit request. So let's just kind of set up a really basic configuration here. So we're going to be utilizing limit request uh, zone. So here we're essentially going to define a few different parameters. Uh, one of them is going to be the rate limit. And then also we're going to define a zone. And that's essentially a key um, that we can then uh, a way of then mapping that across to one of our locations or one of our server blocks. So one of the big questions we have initially is, well, how do we know what to rate limit? So generally, a lot of the different examples that you see will utilize the binary remote address. So this is just a basic configuration. So we do the same. So the idea here is that we're going to grab uh, the user's IP address and we're going to use that IP address to configure the limiting. Uh, <laughs> configure the limiting. We're going to use that IP address to limit that IP address uh, requests per second. So data from that IP address is going to be limited. So now we're going to set up what is a zone. Uh, so this is essentially a memory area where we're going to actually store um, the data or the information about each IP address. So the type of information that's going to be stored here is the IP address and, and how often it has accessed the, the URL. And by doing that, we can then determine whether we need to rate limit the IP address. So limit the amount of requests that user can make towards that location or maybe um, a range of locations. 
So the range here has two parts. We've got the zone name, which we're going to utilize to identify where we want to apply this within our server block or location block. So we're going to call that zone, uh, let's just call it, this is always the hardest thing, uh, limit by address. There we go. Uh, and then the second parameter here is the amount of uh, shared memory we want to assign. So we can do 10, so for example, 10 megabytes. So if we try and do the maths here, 10 megabytes, so essentially the data we're going to store here is IP address, a little bit of other information. So uh, we're looking at around about maybe 15 to 20,000. It seems quite a big block there. So 15 to 17,000 IP addresses. Uh, we can store in this zone. So to give you a, a general idea, depending on obviously how many people access your website, you might need to change some of these different settings. If we were to take a look through the documentation in terms of what happens when the memory is exceeded, a few different things might happen. It can remove some of the oldest entries and then potentially um, if it still can't accommodate any new records, you might receive a 503 service temporary unavailable message. And additionally to that, um, Nginx may also remove up to two entries um, that have not been used within the previous 60 seconds to accommodate some of the new requests. Okay, so with that in place then, we can move on. And now let's think about the rate. So this is probably one of the most important aspects. So rate equals, and then in seconds, say one second, RS. So this is one request per second. So what does that mean? Well, simply put, it means that the, the rate of the user request or the bot request or any request cannot exceed one request per second. Okay, so I'm not suggesting this is the optimal amount. And the optimal amount, because you're probably thinking, well, what is the optimal amount or what optimal number? That might actually depend on your particular service. So if you have a service, maybe an API service, uh, which is quite heavily um, utilized by an endpoint, a user, just naturally through the application, then this is going to be higher than one that isn't. So there isn't necessarily going to be an optimal amount, which I can say, oh, that's optimal. Um, it might be something that you need to check and review the statistics of the particular application um, that you're trying to rate limit, and then utilize that as a way of guiding you as to what is the best rate to use for your situation. So working in seconds isn't going to necessarily be the best way of working. Well, what we actually find is Nginx actually uh, works via milliseconds. Uh, so in this case, I think uh, one second, we're saying what, 10 milliseconds. So although we're working in seconds here, behind the scenes, Nginx is going to be working in milliseconds. Okay, so with that done, we just need to now apply it. It's as simple as that. I say as simple as that. Um, so let's go for limit request. Um, and then we just need to then set the zone. Uh, so that's the zone that we defined earlier. That was the limit by address. Uh, so we've got that and that will be a basic setup. So let's give this a go. Don't forget you have just changed the configuration. So we're going to either do a reload or a reset or we'll just restart the container. So the Nginx container here, we'll just do a restart and that'll pick up the new configuration. Give that a couple of seconds to load up. Not too sure why it's taking so long. Okay, so it looks like we've got a problem here. Again, um, I haven't utilized a, a semicolon here. This is always going to be the problem. Um, so give that a go. Um, I'll just drop that down here to make it easy to read. Um, we'll give that a go again. There we go. Uh, oh, still got problems. Okay, invalid parameter zone equals. So, okay. Apologies, it's zone equals. Um, flicking in between different languages and such. Uh, it, always a little bit confusing. I forget things. Do apologize. So zone equals, um, let's try it again. And there we go. So <laughs> zone is too small. Okay. So we've got a too small zone. It's because we've not defined our 
um, metric there. Um, okay, now I'm looking really incompetent. So let's start again. And uh, here we go. Now we're ready to apologize. It, I just get in the moment and I'm thinking about other things, thinking forward. Uh, so I make these really simple mistakes. So I do apologize, but it's, it's all good practice. You see how that can be fixed. And I always say that the more problems we have, the better experience we're probably going to have ultimately because you're going to ultimately have problems at some point. So if you see me having problems um, and I'll show you how to fix them, that's obviously going to make your life easier in the long run. Right. So with that done, with that in place, um, let's go ahead and test this out very crudely. Let's just go for a refresh. And you can see that as soon as I click twice within a second, we're receiving a 503. And now, if you want to scare the crap out of um, maybe the person monitoring uh, your website, you might want to stick to a 503. Um, potentially, that's sending the wrong message um, to those who may be managing your server, because potentially that's saying um, there is a problem with the server. But in actual fact, in this case, there isn't. Uh, a problem with the server. Um, potentially there is a, a problem. Well, we know what the problem is. We know that um, we've exceeded the rate limit. Now, there's um, probably a little bit of reading here that you might want to go into if you want to go into this kind of detail as to what would be the best request um, or sorry, response to return. Ultimately, that's going to lead you down the path of reading through the HTTP uh, response codes. Uh, so let's just take a quick look here. And a good resource is the MSDN, the, the MSDN, the uh, MMDN web docs um, here. So let's have a look. So a client error response. So we could have a look at the 400s. Uh, so let's go through this and you can see there are plenty of them here. So if we go down to around about uh, 20, 29. There we go. So we have an actual response for this type of setup. So error 429, too many requests. The user sent too many requests in the given amount of time, rate limiting. So we have a specific error response for this type of setup. So let's go ahead and apply that. If you are capturing and monitoring your server, then this is probably going to give you some better information rather than receiving the error response we had before, which can be a little bit open to what the hell is it? Um, so let's go into it. We're going to set our limits uh, request status. So we're just going to define the status code that we're going to return. That's going to be a 429. So we'll go ahead and just do a restart. And then we'll try this where we are again. So we refresh the page. We should see the page. And you can see this time is a 429. So too many requests. So you can already see that one <laughs> per second uh, isn't necessarily uh, going to be the best rate. Um, so we're going to keep that now just to showcase this um, so that we can easily simulate um, the, the issue here. So we're going to stick to one, but ideally you can see that one isn't necessarily going to be the best rate um, for you. OK, so I probably should have detailed this at the start, exactly the type of topics I was covering. So next, we're going to move into this idea of handling bursts. Now, generally, web applications, um, APIs, uh, they can or there is a need for it to be a little bit bursty. And what that means is that maybe there's an initial request for data and there's going to be a lots of requests. And then after that, the, the requests aren't so rapid. Um, and that might be a general pattern or behavior uh, of a typical web application. Now, our current setup doesn't necessarily bode well to that type of way of working, because here essentially we're saying no one request per second and that's it. Um, so it doesn't necessarily work well in today's um, web environment. So here we have options of handling burst. So to define that, uh, let's just go straight ahead and configure this. So inside of our limit request here, uh, let's add burst equals five. OK. So here what we're doing, we're defining how many requests 
the user or client or bot, whoever's trying to access your service, how many requests they can make in excess of the rate specified um, already. So in this case, they can make one request and five extra. So if you remember previously, we could make one and then we were receiving the too many requests. So let's just now restart and we see this in action. And what we find, find now is that essentially we are going to accept one and then the burst is going to capture those other five requests. Now, if we move across those five, well, let's, let's have a look. So one, bam. So if I do two, two requests, you can see we're okay. Let's do five. We're still okay. Let's do six. See if I can get this going. You can see what's happening here. At this point, a browser refreshing becomes absolutely useless in testing this type of configuration. So there are a whole host of different applications that you can utilize to test this out. Uh, we're not going to delve into deep. I don't want to bring in other applications at this point. So here I am using Mac, and this is going to be probably not something that you can do on Windows. I haven't tested this. Um, so I do apologize, but there, is, there will be a way of doing this um, on Windows, and I may make a separate tutorial for that. In actual fact, it gives me an excuse to do that, of course, doesn't it? But what we're going to do here is we are going to utilize curl to kind of send requests. And what we can do is we can create a file, and then we can simply just run that file. And in that file, we can load it up with requests. So we can simulate multiple requests per second. So here we go. So this is a file. Um, I've just named curl requests.sh and then I've gone ahead and you can see that I've set up some uh, curl requests um, directing it to my server and you can see here that I'm using and so there's two possibilities here now it doesn't always work uh, this way and I do forget off the top of my head um, exactly what's going on here so you can correct me if you like but you can do it without and essentially what's going to happen is if you don't include the and here um, then it's basically just going to run requests uh, first in first out so one at a time the and if the top of my from the top of my head that's going to run everything all at once and then there's a third option um, which is the double and uh, and that does something else okay forget that so the double and will chain everything together uh, the single and runs everything in parallel there we go so that's the, the general principle here um, and how we're going to manage this. So you can see I've made multiple requests here. Uh, let's just drop these down a little bit. So we're going to use six for now. So we're just going to essentially run these requests to our server um, in parallel. So I've dropped this file into the into our folder here. So I just need to make sure I can access it. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. So again, I'm in Mac here. So this might not work on Windows. So you can see that I haven't run it. It's not working. Command not found. So I've gone ahead and dropped this file here into our folder. So it should be accessible here. Right, so I'm going to type in dot slash curl request dot sh. And that's essentially going to run this file and then in parallel run all of these requests to the server. So what's going to return is the page um, that we're trying to access or the code. And that isn't necessarily the most um, useful thing to see at this point. So let's quickly make a, a simple change. So like we did in the previous tutorial, uh, we'll just close that, stop that. Uh, so like we did in the previous tutorial, let's go quickly into our uh, uh, Django folder here. And then we we'll build a, a new folder called templates. And then inside of here, we're just going to build a new file called index.html and then we'll just say um, return underscore okay so we're just going to return that uh, save that so that's that done and then what we're going to need to do in the demo urls let's just drop this down we're going to need to just quickly build a url to that so don't worry if you're new to django but we just need to make a url so this is going to be a path which we can access and we're going to be utilizing uh, this template view, which is essentially going to build an automated view for us, class-based automated view, which is going to serve our new page that we've just generated. So with that in place, so line three and line seven, just add that in. Again, you can just copy and paste this from the repository for this tutorial. 
and then just go into settings here we just need to find the directory so we just need to tell Django the fact that we're utilizing a new template folder and that's where to find all those templates in this case the index file okay so it's getting a little bit jam-packed here so let's just close everything down we'll move that across a little bit and then we'll just go ahead in docker here uh, just because we've made some big changes and again we don't necessarily need to do this but i'm just going to close all the containers and in a very manual way again i don't need to do it this way um, again i'm not too sure what your experience is utilizing docker so that's just the easiest way to get started and to communicate that idea just close everything down and then we'll go ahead and hopefully we'll find the command there we go so docker and compose up we're just now make all those changes and just make sure everything's working before we test out our nginx configuration so it looks like everything is running so let's go back into our server so we're using the slash test and you can see that's returning just return so now when we run the curl um, that should just return return rather than all that other html it makes it easier for us to see okay so let's open up a new uh, shell here and then we run the previous command so it needs to be dot slash and that's obviously now returning what we had before because we need to update this file uh, with the new setting so test test i'm sure i could just kind of find and replace but i've started there we go right so that should now access that okay so you can see what we're returning now we're return 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 so that's what we're returning and notice how slow it is okay so we're not necessarily returning um, all the pages at once although we were requesting them all at once you can see that there is a staggered return and that's essentially what we've generated and created through this setting through this um, this burst setting we've essentially set it up so that every 10 milli milliseconds it's going to serve the next item so eventually what's going to happen here i mentioned that oh no if uh, if we request too much then what we should receive uh, is an error eventually we should get an error we should receive an error and you can see that's happened so we requested too many and this time you can see that um, we are receiving lots of um, too many requests so notice what's happened is that when we run this command we did get the first return and then everything else was just too many because we're trying to send too many and you can see eventually what's happening is that the others that are kind of cached inside of our um, burst bucket if you like um, we are actually then potentially returning so let's just try and fine-tune this slightly so we understand what's happening here uh, without producing a graphic so our setup let's grab our setup um, you can see that we have one request per second and then we have a burst of five so ultimately what's going to happen is that the first request is going to be dealt with um, and then the other five um, are going to be delayed okay so ultimately we have six requests in total anything else after that should essentially be dropped or rejected right so let's go back in here so we've got the first one one two three four and five right so let's just run this give us a go and you can see that we have the first one and the others are delayed um, and you can see that they get returned so we are experiencing what we're expecting now let's go ahead and run the the seventh here so essentially this is one too many remember we have the one and then one two three four the five we've been set up here in the burst and this is essentially one too many so this should receive a a drop and you can see that's happened so too many request is returned and then we go ahead and then uh, return the rest so hopefully that makes sense in terms of the math so try to keep it nice and short obviously you can scale that up so now it's just a case of thinking again uh, what's the optimal amount for burst and again that is something that depends on your application again because depending on how bursty your application is maybe initially um, and there might be other sequential um, reasons for your application to be bursty depending on what it performs so you need to take that in consideration have a look at the statistics um, 
of your application working uh, and to determine what is the best burst and rate per second. So far then, we've seen that we utilized burst here and there was an element of delay before those requests were then responded. So we do have a few different settings here. So it's well worth having a look at some of these. Uh, let me just close that. Right, so one of the options that we have here is the no delay. So we can define no delay here. And let's just go ahead and let's just have a look to see what happens, shall we? Uh, so in this case, we'll go ahead and run. And you can see that we are receiving a delay still. And that's probably because we haven't actually reset the configuration, of course. So don't forget to do that. So let's to restart and try that again. Um, let's give that a go again. And there we go. So notice now this new configuration without no, with no delay set. Essentially, we aren't delaying those additional requests in the burst. Now, we are still receiving 402, a 429 because we are sending too many requests as per specified in our setup currently. Um, so that is definitely um, the case. But you can see that those are returning um, instantly. So now you've got a decision to make, of course. Now, should you have no delay or not? Now, it's probably better to include no delay here because potentially, if not configured correctly, your web pages will be experiencing delay or the user, sorry, will be dis experiencing delay. And particularly if it's an API, um, you're sending API requests, um, you're expecting that page to render um, with all the data that's being captured from your API requests, then it's probably better to set it up with no delay in, in many situations. And that also um, may also affect your search engine optimization. Uh, if you don't include um, no delay, if it's delayed, obviously that's going to um, create a web page that is loading very slowly and that potentially will affect your search engine optimization. So next up then we have two stage rate limiting. So this is a mixture of what we've done so far. So at the moment then, just going back to our previous, we allow one request per second and then we have a burst of five. So we're delaying a further five requests. Right, so it might be that you want to set this up let's just go for 10 to make this easier we can set the delay in different ways so we can say well actually let's have a burst of 10 but our web page actually um, really only requires probably um, a burst of five um, but there may be subsequent requests but what we're going to do is we're going to delay those so we can set up delay for subsequent requests so let's go for uh, delay equals five so now what we have is we accept um, one per second, we're going to set additional 10 burst requests, but five of those requests are going to be delayed. So I've just loaded up the, um, the commands here with a few more requests. So we have over 10 and then we're just going to need to restart to reload this configuration. So what we should see now is that the first five requests um, are going to be burst and then the following will be delayed. So let's just give this a go. And there we go. So one, two, three, four, we got five, and then the following are going to be delayed. There we go. If you like that type of type of kind of buffering, um, a way of kind of buffering um, additional requests that might happen. So you may might know that your web page takes generally 10 requests to load. But there might be occasions where you know you don't want to set up 10 exactly um, because you know not that things should change but there there may be there may be instances where maybe the page gets reloaded again so it then asks for additional 10 but some things might be cached um, on the browser so in which case you might see um, you might see additional request so you need to take all these different things into consideration and eventually you might want to allow a little bit more and then just add some delay for some kind of additional requests that might actually um, occur. So those are the basic principles, if you like, underpinning knowledge um, for basic rate limiting with Nginx. Now, I do apologize if some of the examples weren't exact. Um, I know that some people really like the specifics, um, particularly when I'm giving you um, examples of 
when and how to set it up. I just want to make it as open as possible because I know there's an unlimited amount of uh, possibilities and ways to develop uh, applications. Uh, and of course, I'm trying to just to cater for many people as possible. So I apologize for not giving you any real specifics, but hopefully I've given you enough food for thought so you can start thinking about that and utilizing it within your application. Of course, remember that you don't have to use rate limits in here. It may be um, set in other places. And obviously this is just one of many different security layers potentially that you might want to apply in your infrastructure when serving web pages or web resources. So next up, I'm going to utilize this knowledge and apply it to Django. And we'll go for a basic setup, applying this to the Django admin area. This is a really simple, basic, configuration that we can make on our Nginx server if we are using Nginx to serve our, a, a basic Django application to help protect the admin area. Thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.